Good morning. morning. Great to uh, be here. As Carl said, uh, Susan and I have just loved getting to know uh, he and Jess over the last uh, 10 years. And I hope you guys know you have great pastors. Do you know you've got great pastors? You know, we've uh, we've loved getting to know them and just uh, hearing uh, their generosity, seeing their grace and generosity and hearing uh, their kingdom vision their kingdom vision for uh, the church here in Ipswich, but uh, around the nation. So it's actually a real privilege to be here, part of your Beyond Month, as I'm kind of hearing and seeing a bit more of uh, the kingdom vision. So uh, thanks for being here. And I just want to honour Carl and Jess. These guys are uh, great pastors. Why don't you put your hands together and just uh, <laughs> honour them today. All right, who here, this is a bit of an age test here this morning, who remembers having pocketfuls of these, one cent pieces? Come on, put your hands up if you remember, you know, having pocketfuls of these. Back in the day, everything cost something and 99 cents, you'd go to McDonald's and a Big Mac was $1.99, you'd hand over a $2 note and uh, you'd, you'd get one of these. You know, a big black CD was eleven ninety nine, and uh, you'd, you'd get another one of these. You'd end up with so many of these in, in your pocket that your pants would be uh, falling down. And who remembers? Yeah. Who remembers the animal on the back of the one-cent piece? Who can remember what the animal on the back of the one-cent piece is? Or the type of possum, very good. A feather tail glider, to be exact. The feather tail glider on the back of the uh, one cent piece. But in 1991, the Australian government decided that ones have so little value, we'll stop making them. You know, one, ones just aren't worth the effort anymore, and so we're going to cease making them. You know, when you hand over. 20 bucks for something that's 1999, you deserve one of these. (laughs) These are still legal tender. You know, one cent is still worth one cent. But it's so the value is so small that you don't care that you don't get one. You don't expect one, you don't want one, and you don't care that you don't have pocketfuls of these. They're just not worth the effort. The value of them is so small these days, they're not worth the effort. You see, the value of something changes depending on what we have. You know, Susan and I got four kids, and when our kids were little, you know, I'd come home from work and I'd say to the kids, I'll give you 20 cents if you cut my toenails. (laughs) They'd fight over it. You know, they'd, they'd beg for the opportunity. Why? Because when you're little, 20 cents, you know, is cool. You know, my kids are now all in their 20s. And so if I said to them, you know, I'll give you 20 cents if you cut my toenails, you can imagine the response. Dad, you're feral. You're, 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 you're disgusting. Why? Because they got more money in their piggy bank than I got in the Commonwealth Bank. It's just not worth the effort anymore. You see, the value of, of something, you know, changes depending on what we have. I want you to uh, just think practically about that, just just for a moment this morning. I want you to imagine that you're you're actually Monday morning, it's uh, it's still raining because it's been raining all year, and you're driving down the Ipswich motorway and you've got to get to the airport, all right? But on the side of the road, you actually see some money that is lost. It's yours to pick up. But to pick it up, You've actually got to stop your car over on the side of the road. You've probably driven 100 metres past it uh, by then. You know, you'll have cars honking at you as they're in a hurry, you know, to get into the city or to get to the airport. You've got to climb out. You take your seatbelt off. You've got to climb out of your car. You've got to run all the way back in the rain to pick up that money. Then you've got to run back into your car, put your seatbelt back on, and then find a magical moment to, to get back out, you know, into the traffic. It's a fair bit of effort to pick up that lost money. I just want you to think, who's going to that much effort if you see five cents on the side of the road? No, of course not. (laughs) Who's going to do it for 10 cents? Who's going to stop for 10 cents on the side of the road? None of you. This is a true story. All right, one of my best mates is actually Carl and Betsy's, married to Carl and Betsy's cousin. 
All right, I was following him one day. He was driving an eight-ton truck as I was helping him move. And uh, he stopped in the middle of traffic, got out, and uh, ran down onto the road. And Susan said to me, you better go and see what's wrong. There must be something wrong with the truck. But then before I knew it, he jumped back in the truck and, and, and drove off, held up traffic for a couple of minutes, got to where, you know, the house they were moving into. And uh, I said, Andy, what did you stop in the middle of the road for? He said, I saw 10 cents on the side of the road. <laughs> he went to all that effort. You know, Carl, Jess, Betsy, they might be generous, but it doesn't run in the family. <laughs> all right, tightest man in Australia. You know, come on, who's stopping? You got to, who's going to all that effort for 20 cents? Hands up, anyone yet? No, anyone doing it for 50? No, oh, someone up the back. You think 50? Yeah, okay, very good. You a uni student by any chance? <laughs> Uh, a dollar, come on, hands up if you need to see a dollar before you'll get up. Come on, this is that start gold, two dollars. Oh, Carl's getting, you do not pay your pastors enough. He's getting out for two bucks. Who needs to see something with paper? You know, five bucks, who's getting up? Who's going to the effort for five dollars? Very good, there's a few young people over there thinking I can get a snack box at KFC for five bucks. <laughs> Ten bucks? Yeah, okay, yeah, so, some others are going for 10. Who needs 20 before they're going to all that effort? Okay, there's a few people think I can get four coffees for $20. Who hasn't put their hand up yet? I hope you're all giving generously to this Beyond campaign, I tell you. Who needs 50? Okay, a bunch of you getting up for 50. Who's hanging out for a hunch? They don't let pastors have a $100 note. <laughs> it's true. It's true. As the value goes up, we'll go to more effort to get that which is lost. When there's, when there's big value for us, we'll go to significant effort. If you've ever lost the remote for the TV, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Incredible value. Turn the house upside down, you know, searching for that thing because it's so valuable. <laughs> But when something has little value, little value, we'll go to little effort to get that which is lost. That's why the poor old one cent piece is no longer in existence. It just doesn't have enough value. It's not worth the effort. Now today I want to talk about what Jesus says about the value of ones. And you need to understand before we read, you know, these very famous stories in Luke chapter 15 need to remember some other things in, in Scripture that, that, that talk about, you know, the, the nature and the breadth and the, the majesty of God. It, it says that he owns the cattle. Psalm 24, it says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God is very wealthy. You know, it says, it says that all of the stars thrown into the sky, he knows each one of them. He knows exactly where they go. Every single person on planet Earth created, you know, in the image of God. All six billion people, he knows every hair on our head. You know, there's a lot of objects, there's a lot of people that, that, that God has in his control. There's a lot of things that God has to keep track of. You'd kind of think that one of anything wouldn't have that much value to a God like that. Let's read Luke chapter 15. It says this, verse 1. It says, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now you've got to remember why these three famous parables are told by Jesus. It's because he's welcoming sinners and eating with them. And he either, you know, hears what the religious people of the time are saying or he knows in his heart, you know, what they're muttering about and they're saying, what is Jesus doing? You know, if this man really is a teacher, why is he spending time with these sinners? Why is he eating with these people? These people have no value. And Jesus either you know, he is there muttering or he knows in his heart and so he tells these very famous stories. He says, then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses just one of them. 
Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Just pause there for a minute because I think we can get too sort of comfortable with these passages. They're too well known to us. He's got a hundred sheep. He loses one of them and he goes, leaves the 99 to go after the one. Actually, Jesus, I wouldn't do that. That doesn't make sense. Now, Jesus, hasn't your parents taught you that a bird in the hand is worth more than two in the bush? You got 99? Kind of just leave the one and be grateful for, for what you've already got. You know, true story, my, my uncle is actually a modern-day shepherd. He's got a sheep and uh, wheat property in western New South Wales. And I loved going there as a kid. All of my school holidays, I used to beg to go out there and help, you know, on the farm. And I remember as I got a little bit older, I was out with my cousins. We were bringing in a mob of sheep. It was probably more like, you know, 500 to 1,000 sheep. There was, was more than 100. And uh, there was one crippled sheep that kept getting left behind. There was something wrong with one of its hind legs and it couldn't keep up with the rest of the mob. And my cousin came to me and said, you put that one sheep on the back of your motorbike and ride it back to the shearing sheds and we'll bring in the rest with the dogs. Now that sounds simple. (laughs) But have you ever try to balance a 100 kilo merino on the back of a motorbike. You know, I'm riding up this grassy hill, I've got one hand on the accelerator, I've got one hand on the clutch, and I've got my third hand, you know, trying to hold this sheep, you know, on the back of the motorbike. And if you haven't worked with sheep before, you know, sheep are stupid. And they're heavy. And even though I was trying to help this thing, you know, it kept jumping off the back of my motorbike. And I'd have to turn back around, pick it back up, put it back on the motorbike, take off back up the hill. I'd get a little bit further up. Once again, it would jump off the back of my motorbike, hobble sort of back down the hill. And I'd have to go back down, get it back on. After the third time... You know, of this sheep jumping off my motorbike, me going to all the effort to put it back on. I decided this one's not worth the effort. I'm leaving this one behind. And I rode back and caught up with my my cousins and they said, you know, where's that sheep? What what happened to it? I told him the story. I, I said, stupid thing kept falling off. It was a lot of effort trying to put it back on my motorbike. And country boys don't say much. But he just kind of looked at me like, are you on drugs? (laughs) And I look back at him. I'm thinking, it's just one sheep, mate. Uh, Are you on drugs? (laughs) He got on my bike and he rode all the way back down and picked up that sheep and rode it all the way back to the sheds. Why? Because sheep have value. Sheep have value to a shepherd. Sheep have real tangible dollar value to a farmer. They're worth the effort. You know, I was one time, I've learned a lot about, you know, some of these passages by hanging out with modern day shepherds. One time, you know, we were marking lambs, you know, in a in a pen. And it's kind of uh, it's kind of like youth group for sheep. You know, they all, they all go stupid and they do a big stacks on in the corner. And uh, I remember they were all doing this big stacks on in the, in the corner and my cousin was all of a sudden, you know, just went into an urgent panic and he's just pulling all of these lambs off to get down to the one that's on the bottom that's actually been crushed and stopped breathing. And he picks up this little lamb and he starts doing mouth to mouth. He's giving CPR, you know, to a lamb. And I'm looking at this dude thinking... I'm related to this dude. You know, he's kissing a sheep. And it didn't work. The little lamb went to sheep heaven. But that's a lot of effort for one sheep. And this is what Jesus is saying here. Every single one has value. Let me keep reading. Verse 5. When he finds it, He joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me! I found my lost sheep! 
He puts it on his shoulders and carries it all the way back. I'm telling you, that's a lot of effort. Sheep are heavy. And then the story actually gets ridiculous because he's found his lost sheep and he's brought it home. He gets the whole community together and they throw a party for this one lost sheep. It's a crazy story. And obviously Jesus is looking in their eyes and going, they don't get it yet. And so he actually tells another story almost identical. He says, suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. She just loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, rejoice with me, I've found my lost coin. It's the same deal. The, the one that is lost is so valuable to the woman that an all-out search is called for until it's found. It becomes the priority. And then when she finds one, finds one measly coin, she, she calls all the community together and, and throws a party. And Jesus is looking at them and they obviously still don't get it. And, and so he tells a third story. He says, if you, kind of, you don't get it about the sheep, you don't get it about the coin, I want you to imagine a father who has two sons and he loses one of them. How valuable is that one son? How much will he just long to embrace that one son when he comes home? And you've got to remember, whenever God says one thing three times in the Bible, it's really important. It doesn't happen very often. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. One thing, three times. And Jesus here is saying, he's saying one thing, three times. It's not about a lost sheep. It's not about a lost coin. In Luke 15 verse 10, it says, Every time one lost person repents, there is a party that goes on in all of heaven. All of heaven celebrates us rejoicing in the presence of all the angels because one lost person repents. You see, more than anything in the world, God wants a relationship with us. Our, our sin separated us from the God who is holy, holy, holy. But God wasn't happy to leave it that way. And he went to all the effort. He actually sent his son, you know, to die on a cross to take the thing that separated us from his presence, to actually remove the sin that kept us from coming into his loving presence. He took the initiative. He made the effort. Now, remember the principle we looked at at the start. The value of the lost object determines the effort, determines the sacrifice you're willing to make to find it. Just, just to be reminded a bit this morning of how much God values you. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. It's not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son, Jesus, as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God sacrificed his one and only son for you. That's how much God values you. You. We, we need to get this this morning. You're one of the ones. You're one of the ones. When you put your faith in Jesus, whether it was last week, last year, last decade, last century, whenever that was, whenever you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you repented of your sins and you came back into a loving relationship, you know, with, with your Father in heaven, all of heaven stopped for you. There was a party for you. There was a cake with your name on it. You're one of the ones. But you're not the only one. And that's the point of Jesus' story. Everyone that's still lost is valuable to God. And it's worth the effort to see them saved. I came across this poster. We uh, got a picture of a poster of uh, Ernest Shackleton and his ship, uh, the Endurance. I was, uh, I was in the Salamanca markets at Hobart a few years ago, and I didn't know this story, and I hadn't seen this poster before, but as I began to read it, 
I actually just began weeping in the middle of these markets. December 15, 1914, Ernest Shackleton headed off with 28 men uh, across the South Weddell Sea to be the, the first men to cross Antarctica on, on foot. And they, floated, they, they navigated floating pack ice uh, for weeks until his, the ship, the Endurance, eventually got stuck here. And they were stuck there for 281 days uh, until the Endurance, actually, it was a timber boat, you know, was crushed and, and it sank. And Shackleton knew that they couldn't just wait there. No one was coming to save them. And so they dragged three rowboats, you know, over miles and miles of floating pack ice until they got to an uninhabited island named Elephant Island. And they set up camp there, but Shackleton realised that they weren't, uh, they couldn't survive there forever. And so he took seven men and they got in one of these little rowboats called the James Cairn, a little 20-foot rowboat, and they paddled over 1,500 kilometres of icy seas over a couple of weeks to get to South Georgia Island, the closest inhabited island with a whaling station, but they landed on the wrong side of the island. And they had to climb over mountains of ice and glaciers. And by the time they got to the whaling station, they were naked, their clothes had completely deteriorated, they were starving hungry, but they were alive. They were safe. They would be fed. They were saved. But this is what Shackleton wrote to a letter, in a letter to a friend. He says, when we got to the whaling station, it was the thought of all those comrades that made us so mad with joy. We didn't so much feel safe as that they would now be saved. You see, those seven men, they could have stayed there and enjoyed the safety and the comfort. They, they were alive. They, they were safe. But Shackleton, three days later, you know, bought a boat and headed back to, uh, to rescue the rest of the men that were still you know, floating on ice in the middle of the sea. And the first boat didn't make it. And he had to turn back. It wasn't big enough. And he sold it and bought a bigger boat. And the second boat didn't make it. The third boat didn't make it. Three failed attempts. He had to get all of his money wired to England. He spent every last cent that he had. And with that fourth boat that he bought, he made it back to these men that had been living on a piece of ice for 18 months. And this is what it says at the bottom of that poster. It says, The endurance became firmly wedged in ice and was eventually crushed. Ernest Shackleton, with some of his men, rode 800 miles in an open boat to get help for the men left behind. Listen to this. Not one man was lost. Not one man was lost. That poster now has on, been on my wall in my office for many years. And every time I wonder if serving and leading in the local church to reach lost people in our community and around the world is worth the effort... I just look at that poster. I remember the effort so that not one man would be lost. And it reminds me of Luke chapter 15. Every single one that is lost is so valuable to God that he notices when they're missing. Every single one that, that is lost alone and suffering is so valuable to God that an all-out search is called for until they're found. And everyone that is lost, alone, marginalised, hungry, suffering, without hope, is so valuable to God that when they come home, all of heaven stops to celebrate. Once. You know, sometimes the mission that God has given us to actually go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, it kind of seems too big. It kind of seems a little bit too hard. Like, where do I start? You know, how can I actually be a part of that? I just want to give you four simple things in these stories that I think every single one of us can do. Firstly, notice the ones. Notice the ones. You know, the shepherd noticed one sheep was missing. It was pretty hard. You get 100 sheep, try and notice one of them's missing. It's pretty hard work. The woman notices one lost coin. The father notices 
one lost son. He notices the ones. You know, in 2008, I was uh, in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, uh, investigating, establishing a, a vocational training centre for girls rescued from sex trafficking. Now, I've got to be honest, in 2008, I actually didn't know there was a sex slave industry that was still operating in the world. And I'd never, ever been to Cambodia, but a lady in our church got woken up by God in the middle of the night and says, I want you to go to Cambodia and teach girls rescued from trafficking to make sugar flowers. That's pretty odd. Can you imagine how much I know about making sugar flowers? About as much as I knew about setting up a vocational training centre so girls would have hope for the future. And I must admit, I got there and I thought, I've got no idea what to do. God, this is crazy. And I'm just about, after being there five or six days, I'm just about to get on a plane to fly home to the safety of Australia. And I was saying goodbye to this girl, Nita. Nita was sold for her virginity at 12, along with all of her sisters. And the brothel owner's son, where she lived, fell in love with her and married her at 15. And she no longer had to pay her debt off in that brothel anymore, but she was sent to a neighbouring brothel. And when she was told that her little daughter would also be sold when she got to age, she panicked and ran away, but dirt poor, no schooling, no resources, no hope of lifting herself out of this life that she was in. And she met my friend Ruth, who just started running a few classes, just teaching some girls some new skills. And I'm standing, I'm sitting actually in the tuk-tuk, about to head back to the airport, outside the brothel where Nita was still living. And it was this moment in time. I just felt the whisper of the Holy Spirit say, she's worth the effort. Do it for her. In the last 14 years, you know, we've seen nearly 200 girls get rescued, baptised, get new skills, a job for the future. In fact, Nita has become an international cake decorator. She's travelled to other countries to actually share the gospel and teach others, you know, how to get lifted out of this awful, awful life into something better. Now, there's still probably 40 to 50,000 girls trapped in slavery in Cambodia. But there's 200 that aren't anymore. And every single one of them is worth the effort. Just encourage you. Notice the ones. You see, you can't change the world for everyone. But you can change the world for someone. This has been one of the great joys of my life. Just seeing what God has done in these girls' lives as they let Jesus in and he heals them one day at a time. As I hear their stories, I've got no idea how they can feel joy again. But Jesus has done a miracle in their lives. That's who Jesus wanted me to notice. You can't change the world for everyone, but you can change the world for someone. Who does he want you to notice? Simple prayer. You can all pray every day. Jesus, who do you want me to notice today? You see, you'll never lock eyes with anybody that's not valuable to him. And he's put each of us in a circle of influence, you know, here in this city of Ipswich, you know, in our workplaces. There are lost people, there are people that are alone and suffering and living without hope. Jesus, who do you want me to notice? Simply notice the ones. Secondly, prioritize the ones. You notice in each of these stories, the one that's lost becomes a priority. Even though the shepherd's got 99, the one that's lost, you know, becomes the priority. You see, when something is a priority in your life, you have a plan. So if your finances are a priority, you have a financial plan. You know, if your fitness is a priority, you have a fitness plan. You know, if living in a house that doesn't leak, you know, is a priority, then you have a house plan. And I just want to encourage you here today, this house, this house of God has a plan. It's a good plan. 
I've been inspired sitting here, hearing the stories about CAP and about Catalyst Care and compassion and church planting. You know, you guys have got a plan. It's a good plan. I want to encourage you today, get behind the plan because this is the priority of God. And so good to hear Cheryl's story. Cheryl, you're one of the ones. There's a party in heaven for you when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. It's a good plan. How do we know something's a priority in our lives? All you need to do is go back to the last month, have a look at your calendar and your bank statement. It'll tell you what's a priority. It'll tell you what's really important. What are you doing with your time and where are you placing your money? That'll tell you your priority. Notice the ones, prioritise the ones. Give generously of your time, your talent and your treasure. Thirdly, welcome the ones. This is what Jesus is getting in trouble for. It's why he told these three stories to begin with. He's welcoming sinners and eating with them. Sinful people wanted to be near Jesus. Does that ever strike you as odd? When you read the Gospels, drunkards and prostitutes and tax collectors and and people of low morals and people that have been ostracized from the religious community, they wanted to be near Jesus. It causes me great pain that sinful people in our nation want to be nowhere near the church. We're the body of Christ. I actually say uh, to my church probably once or twice a year, I want to smell more smoke in the foyer on Sundays. I I, I want to hear more swearing. You know, I I, I want to see more hangovers walking in on a Sunday. I'd prefer if it wasn't the pastoral team. (laughs) And not because I think those things are good things. But hear me right here. What it means is, is that our community feels welcome to come just as they are. And that'll take all of us. That's not just Carl and Jess and Betsy and your other pastors. That's all of us creating a community that welcomes people the same way that Jesus welcomed people into his presence. If I'm going to get in trouble, and I do get in trouble, I want to get in trouble for what Jesus is getting in trouble for. Let's get in trouble for the same things Jesus got in trouble for. Notice the ones, prioritize the ones, welcome the ones, and lastly, celebrate the ones. All three lost stories, whole community that comes together and celebrates because one lost thing is found. Now, there's a couple in our church named Michael and Kate who uh, sat in about the third row, actually, for four years. Business background, you know, quite successful in what they were doing in life, but completely unchurched. Never been involved in church, never grown up in the church. But uh, through a set of circumstances, they decided to, you know, find out a little bit who this Jesus was about. And they sat in our pews for four years, unsaved. And I remember the Sunday they walked to the front and gave their life to Jesus. And I baptised them a couple of weeks later. There might be a photo of baptising both Michael and and Kate. And I realised in that moment, as I'm standing just down the front in our church like this, and I'm praying for them, I realised this isn't just a lifestyle change. This isn't just a change about, you know, what they're going to do on a Sunday what, what, what they're, what they're going to eat and drink. This is a change of eternity. Their eternal destinies have just changed. There's going to be generational change in their family, but their eternal destinies have just changed. And the, there's a party going on in heaven for these two people right now. That was incredible joy. I felt that joy as I baptised them a couple of weeks later. Kate's now on our staff, she's our operations director at our church and God's doing a miracle, you know, through her extended family. But it took four years for them to actually get to that point of just being a part of a community that loves them. You know, I'm really glad that someone thought my grandfather was worth the effort. In 1952, 
My grandfather had come back from World War II and he really just wanted to uh, make some money and start a family and had no background in church, had never grown up in the church and spent, you know, a lot of his, what we'd call adolescent growing up years in the army, serving in World War II. And in 1952, my grandfather, whose name is Frank, also had a neighbour named Frank. Any Franks in the room today? No, there's not too many Franks around these days, but in 1952, there were Franks everywhere, all right? And my grandfather's neighbour was a Christian and back then there was a very new housing estate and there was no fences. And my grandfather said, neighbour Frank kept wandering into his backyard and inviting him to church. And he kept rejecting him. And he t- he'd tell me, he couldn't remember how many times he rejected him, but he remembered it was, it was several times, multiple times that he'd rejected this invitation to church. But then neighbour Frank came over one day and said to my grandfather, Frank, I've actually just bought a car. Now, in 1952, my grandfather had never owned a car, he'd never driven a car. Neighbour Frank said to my grandfather, if you come to church with me on Sunday night, I'll let you drive my car. (laughs) My grandfather changed his mind. (laughs) And he went to this church in Epping, New South Wales, there was a man up the front named Ross Beadle sharing the gospel and he said it was the first time in his life that he ever understood that he was a sinner and that he needed a saviour and he felt like he was talking straight to him. And I still got his baptism certificate from that night. Back then in the Churches of Christ, you got baptised on the spot. The tank was full. And it says this, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, believing this with all my heart and resting wholly upon the finished work of Jesus for salvation. I confess my faith in him at Epping Church of Christ on the Lord's Day, July the 6th, 1952, and was buried with Christ in baptism. Frank Ellsmore, a sinner saved by grace. Now, my grandfather passed away over 20 years ago now, but my grandmother passed away at 99 just before COVID hit. I'm actually glad that she did because we all got to go to the funeral and we had to fight over who was going to lead her funeral because seven of us are full-time pastors somewhere in the local church in Australia. And as our family gathered for that funeral, every single person is a follower of Jesus Christ serving somewhere in a local church in Australia. How did that happen? One old dude named Frank thought my grandfather Frank was worth the effort And even though he got rejected time after time after time, he kept persisting because he knew his eternal destiny would be changed and his generations, four generations later, have been changed because one guy wouldn't give up on my grandfather. I tell you, when you notice the ones, when you prioritise the ones, when you welcome the ones, and when you celebrate with all of heaven, when one person puts their faith in Jesus Christ... Who knows what's going to happen for the kingdom of God? There are lost people in this community. There's lost people all over the world that need to know the love and the grace of Jesus that you've come to know for yourself. Every single one of them is worth the effort. Every single one. You can't change the world for everyone. But you can change the world for someone. I want to encourage you today. Notice the ones. Prioritise the ones. Welcome the ones into this fabulous community. This is a great community. And celebrate the ones with all of heaven every time one person comes to know Jesus. I want to give you a very tangible reminder of this. Yeah, on the Facebook yesterday, Carl said, uh, you're going to be richer if you come to church today in more ways than one. Well, this is one way. I hope God's spoken to you something through his word. But here's another way. I'd love to give you a one-cent piece. I'm just going to put, someone's going to hold these bowls down the front for me, maybe. I'm going to, I'm going to encourage you in a minute to come and get one of these one-cent pieces. They're real. Carl has searched eBay and he's bought every one of them. 
If you want to be part of this big mission of God, reaching out to those in need in this community and around the world, and you just need a little tangible reminder, I, I'm going to keep persevering. I'm going to keep prioritizing. I'm going to keep noticing. I'm going to keep welcoming. Maybe you've got one person in your family it's very close to home. Maybe you've got one person in your street you're going to keep praying for until they come home. Stick it on your fridge. Put it on your car visor. Put it on your screen. Put it on your phone. You'll never super glue it onto the back of your phone. You'll never forget every day. Just pray for that one person. Let, can we stand together this morning? Let me pray. And then I encourage you to come. Father God, come. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and move in our hearts. Help us to see people the way that you see people. Help us to value people the way that you value people. Help us to love people the way that you love people. And God, I just really pray this morning, you'd help us to persevere. I want to pray for people here who've been reaching out to family members or neighbours for some time and feel hopeless. God, would come by your Holy Spirit, give us strength and perseverance this morning to not give up. And God, give us a sensitivity. A sensitivity. Help us to hear what your Spirit is saying to us in this season. Help us to know when to speak, when to invite, when to pray, when to just love, when to be hospitable. But show us how to reach out to the ones who desperately need your love and grace. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, as we sing this song, there's some people out here just holding some buckets of one cent pieces. You want to be part of this great big mission, just reaching out to one who desperately needs Jesus. Just come and grab one as we sing this song. Take it back to your seat. Put it somewhere where you're never going to forget. Every single one matters to God. Bless you.